We are going on that safari. See the lion from the Ferrari. Hope we do not get the Ferrari. It's a party time. We are going on that safari. See the lion from the Ferrari. Hope we do not get the Ferrari. It's a party time. World War I. When you hear the words, what comes to mind? Trench warfare, millions dead for little gain, the Armenian Genocide, the Dardanelle Campaign. You know, the fun stuff. These aren't things that are looked look back on for a good laugh, except out of probably the absurdity of it all. Today we are looking at a man and a battle that takes the expectations of the war and throws them completely out the window. Today we cover Jeffrey Spicer Simpson and the Battle of Lake Tanganyika. Jeffrey Basil Spicer Simpson was born onto his family's farm in Hobart, Tasmania, an island off Australia that continues to prove that the Aussies are true mad lads. Mad lads without a domestic car industry, but I digress. Not long after his birth, at the request of his mother, he was moved to France. He would be sent to school in England and would join the Royal Navy at age 14. Assigned in Asia, he would mostly do surveying and help distinguish boundaries, completing the first triangulated survey of the Yangtze River. While on these adventures, he obtained some colorful tattoos, anything from snakes to butterflies, reportedly. When the war broke out, he was assigned to a contraband control vessel that happened to get torpedoed and proceeded to get a desk job instead. Now let's take a trip to German East Africa, now Rwanda, Burundi, and the mainland part of Tanzania and part of Mozambique. The Germans were planning to launch the Graf von Gotzen onto Lake Tanganyika, the major lake in the west of the colony, in an attempt to maintain supremacy and supply their troops in the region. The British Admiralty learned of this, and had an idea of only one man for the job. Our undistinguished hero we did not deserve, Lieutenant Commander Spicer Simpson was on the case. The plan was crafted by Boer War veteran John Lee to send two powerful motorboats to contest the German control of the lake with speed bump at I mean, Belgian assistance. This plan was approved by Admiral Henry Jackson, who surmised that wherever there was water, there should be a Royal Navy ship. Our two ships' proposed names by Spicer Simpson were Cat and Dog. The Admiralty doesn't like fun, so he had to change it to Mimi and Tutu. Notice anything about it? The expedition would be sent forth, and our hero would grace his crewmates with his tales of adventure, of intrigue, of all which were most likely bullshit. The expedition would cross the vast lands of the Congo and some mountains for good measure. Our man would go on to belittle the Belgians and don a skirt which he would wear at all times and bear his tattoos for all to see. Due to his eccentricities, he would go on to gain the name Lord Bellycloth. The German Kingani would be the first into the fray, scouting out the Belgian port and learning of the British expedition. The same thing would happen a couple days later, but this time they were spotted and Mimi and Tutu would give chase. The Kingani tried to get away using its speed, but Mimi was faster, so it then tried to bring its gun on one of the ships, but failed due to the other vessel's speed, and for good measure, be rammed by Mimi. The Kingani's captain, Sub-Lieutenant Jung, was killed and her gun damaged. Seeing no way out, the ship surrendered. She would be repaired by the British and renamed the HMS Fifi, with her gun moved to the rear and a larger British gun mounted on the front. Spicer Simpson claimed to have fired the crippling shot. Spoiler alert, he did not. The Hedwig von Westman would be sent out in early February to find the Kigani, and was spotted in the early morning hours. Flotilla would be sent forth to take out the Hedwig, minus the Tutu, which was stuck for repairs. The Mimi would harass the Hedwig, who tried to train its guns on the small ship, but this gave the Fifi time to catch up. Using its 12-pound gun, it striked the Hedwig in its boiler, and the damaged ship's captain ordered it scuttled. Our hero, ever the humanitarian, supposedly picked up a locker before trying to help the survivors of the Hedwig. This locker would contain the first German naval ensign captured of the war, and it would certainly not be the last. After this defeat, the von Gutzen was deployed by captive Gustav Zimmer to search for the Hedwig, coming into contact with the Fifi and Spicer Simpson. Our valiant humanitarian ordered not to engage and fall back to base where he would promptly go to bed. Yes, he went to sleep. We've got a 
I need a bigger boat. Having rested well, Spicer Simpson realized they needed something larger to combat the Gutsen. So he went on a journey to find a suitable ship. Things weren't going so great for the Germans, however, as the Gutsen's guns had to be removed for the land forces, and were replaced with wooden replicas. Of course, the British didn't know this. Eventually, the situation in German East Africa would deteriorate further with the Entente capture of Dar es Salaam Railway, and the Gutsen would be scuttled. This would not be the end of her service, however, as she was raised by the British after the war, and is still in the operation today under the name of the MV Liemba. So where does this leave our hero now? Well, he was relieved of command after refusing to aid Entente troops in capturing... Mpungalu? Don't quote me on that. And fell ill, being shipped back to England. He would go on to receive the Belgian Croix de Guerre, and having nicked a distinguished service order for his actions against the Hedwig. After learning of his true performance, however, the Admiralty would never give him a naval command again. He was later appointed Assistant Director of Naval Intelligence, having been settled at the rank of Captain, and a Naval Delegate and French Translator at the Versailles Peace Conference in 1919. After acting as Secretary and Official Interpreter to the First International Hydrographic Conference in London in 1919, he was elected the first Secretary General of the International Hydrographic Bureau. Riveting, am I right? He served in that role from 1921 to 1937. He would spend much of his later years in British Columbia. He gave a series of lectures on his command in Lake Tanganyika and helped write a National Geographic article on his transportation of the two boats to, through the jungles of the Congo. He would go on to die on 29th of January, 1947. The man was best remembered by a quote from... Jules Fodden, as a man court-martialed for wrecking his own ships, an inveterate liar, and a wearer of skirts. <laughs>